Hey everybody, this video is called Israel versus Moab, and tonight we're going to continue our pass-through study here in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 3, where we're going to be looking at the war against Moab. And uh, before we start diving into the text here, I just wanted to make mention that this passage, there was actually a Moabite stone that was discovered back in 1868, and it contained the Moabite inscription that confirms many of the events of this chapter. But it gives a distinctively pro-Moabite spin, which, of course, they want to make themselves look good. But just an interesting note to make, as when you study the Old Testament, some things are discovered many, many years later, even recently in the last, you know, 30, 40 years. And so, 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 1-3, through 3, says, Now Jehoram, the son of Ahab, became king over Israel at Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned 12 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, but did, but not like his father and mother. For he put away the sacred pillar of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he persisted in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin but he did not depart from them. So remember that Jehoram was Ahaziah's brother, as we learned last week when we wrapped up on Saturday, 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 51. And the 18th year was approximately 852 BC. And it was Jehoshaphat's 18th year of rule after the death of his father, Asa in 870 BC. And Jehoram, he's the co ruler with Jehoshaphat between 853 and 848 BC. And the 12 years would range between 852 to 841 BC. And the pillar of Baal was likely an image of the god Baal that King Ahab made and placed in the temple that he built to Baal back in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 32, 33. And the image was only put into storage, not permanently destroyed, because it reappeared at the end of Jehoram's reign, as we're going to see later on coming up in chapter 10, verse 26, 27 in a couple weeks. And remember that Jeroboam in verse 3 from 1 Kings chapter chapters 11 through 14, he reigned between 931 and 910 BC. And Jehoram also to reflect on came from a dysfunctional family. And his father was one of the worst kings that the northern Israelites ever had, they ever knew, with Jezebel as his mother who we know was like the worst queen in Israel ever known. And Jehoram, he was the ninth consecutive bad king over the northern kingdom, which the northern kingdom, they never had a godly king. And he was nothing like his parents, though. That is something positive about this guy. And he put away the Baal worship with bad motives. And we're going to see in verse 13 that even though he puts away Baal worship, that Elisha is not entertained. He's not impressed. And so verse 4 and 5 says, Now Mesha, king of Moab, was a sheep breeder, and he regularly paid the king of Israel 100 lambs, 100,000 lambs, and the rule of the wool of 1,000 or 100,000 rams. What happened when Ahab died that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel? So, according to this Moabite stone that was discovered back in 1868 in Dion, it was dated between 840 and 820 BC on this stone. And Moab was east of the Dead Sea between the Arnon and the Zered Brook. In Amos chapter 1 verse 1, it tells us that Moab's king Mesha was a sheep breeder, and he supplied the king of Israel 
with lambs and wool. And this was Moab's annual tribute to the Israelite king. And Masha used Ahab's death as an opportunity to cast off the political denomination of Israel with its heavily economic burden. In Moab's rebellion, it took place approximately 853 BC during the reign of Ahaziah. And Jehoram, he determined to put down Moab's rebellion upon his accession to Israel's throne in 852 BC. And he mobilized Israel for war and asked Jehoshaphat of Judah to join him in the battle, as we're going to see here in the upcoming verses 6 through 8, which says, So King Jehoram went out to went out of Samaria at that time and mustered all Israel. Then he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab was rebelled, has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to fight against Moab? And he said, I will go up. I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. Then he said, Which way shall we go up? And he answered, By way of the wilderness of Edom. So verses 6 through 8, Jehoshaphat, we know from 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 41 through 43, he followed the godly footsteps of his father Asa. Yet we see that Asa fought against Israel. And while Jehoshaphat made peace with the northern kingdom, the two nations were now willing to come together to fight a common enemy. In verse 9 through 10 says, So the king of Israel went up with the king of Judah and the king of Edom, and they marched on the roundabout route seven days. And there was no water for the army, nor for the animals that followed them. And the king of Israel said, Alas, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And so... The combined armies of Judah, Israel, and Edom had to travel a great distance to attack Moab from the south. And Jehoram's guilty conscience continued or convinced him that this calamity was the judgment of God. In verse 11 and 12 says, But Jehoshaphat said, Is there no prophet of the Lord here? that we may inquire of the Lord by him. So one of the servants of the king of Israel answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat is here, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. So poured water on the hands, it was a custom of washing hands before and after meals like what good practice should be today before you go to the dinner table or you know eat your dinner in the living room with your family you should be washing your hands before and after your meals and the idiom meant that Elisha had personally served Elijah and Jehoshaphat recognized that Elisha was a true prophet of the Lord and we see encouraging humility on the part of the three kings as typically kings would demand to come to them and not actually go into whomever they saw like the prophet. In verse 13 through 15 says, Then Elisha said to the king of Israel, what have, I, what have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. But the king of Israel said to him, no, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. But now bring me a musician. Then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And so verse 13 is a Hebrew idiom that expressed the completely different perspective of two individuals. 
And Elisha, he sarcastically ordered Jehoram to consult the prophets of his father Ahab, the prophets of the northern kingdom, deviant religion, and the prophets of his mother Jezebel, and the prophets of Baal and Asherah. And Elisha agreed to seek word from the Lord because he had a great respect for, for the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as we saw in 1 Kings 22, verse 43 on Saturday. And the music was used to accompany praise and prayer, which calmed the mind of the prophet that he might clearly hear the word of the Lord. And sometimes when you're studying or when you're spending time in prayer, sometimes it's great to have music on in the background, you know, godly music, not this censor secretive stuff, you know, the, the praise of me, 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 me. Sometimes, you know, putting on some praise music, it really calms you down and it gets you to, you know, process everything. And music often accompanied prophecies in the Old Testament, as also seen later on in First Chronicles chapter 25, verse 1. And like I said, music's a great thing. Music calms my mind at times. And there is a great spiritual power that comes with music. And, you know, what we got to be careful of with music, too, is that we don't swing into emotionalism. Sometimes people mistaken a nice music in the background at a worship service as the Holy Spirit, you know, sending a rush over all the people. But I'm not going to get into that field with this. But uh, verse 16 through 19, it continues here. And he said, Thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, you should not see wind, nor shall you see rain, yet that the valley be filled with water, so that you, your cattle, and your animals may drink. And this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. He will also deliver the Moabites into your hand. Also you shall attack every fortified city and every choice city, and shall cut down every good tree, and stop up every spring of water, and ruin every good piece of land with stones." And so, the valley in verse 16 was probably speaking of the northeast area of Arabah that was west of the high kinds of Moab and southeast of the Dead Sea. And it seems like a strange word from God into the promise of water being provided without any apparent rain or uh, storm. I almost said snow. We don't want to talk about snow here. But... You know, we, we see a miracle that's about to unravel here. And God promised to send the water to the valley, but they had to dig the ditches to catch what God would provide. <clears throat> and when the kings returned from their visit to Elisha and they told their commanders to have the men dig the ditches, it must have been hard to hear. And... Oftentimes, you know, everybody wants to see God work, but are we putting in, you know, our ends of things? Are we getting our hands dirty? You know, everybody wants to see revival, but are we doing our part, staying faithful, preaching the word of God, and carrying out our part? You know, it seems like in America, that evangelism, you know, the church going outside the walls, it's on a decline, and, you know, people are afraid to talk about Jesus outside of the church. And being in the middle of the desert drained. And it didn't seem appetizing to work hard labor or of the digging of the ditches in dry ground. Yet the work was essential. They had to do their end. And a principle we can take is that God wants us to prepare for his blessing. He wants us to listen to him and to anticipate that we're going to have to work and get ready for it. And God wanted to give them more 
than immediate provision. He wanted to give them complete victory over their enemies. In verse 20, it says, Now it happened in the morning when the grain offering was offered that suddenly water came by the way of Edom and the land was filled with water. And you might remember from Exodus chapter 29, verse 38 through 41, that the grain offering was offered daily. And divinely created flash floods from the mountains of Edom caused the water to flow in the direction there of the Dead Sea. And this water was caught in the canals that had been built in the valley. And if they had obeyed, if they had disobeyed God's word by not digging these ditches, then they would not get to experience the blessing of God. And God often moves us to do things that may not make sense at the moment for us, but they are the things that will prepare us for what God is going to do in the future. And the ditches, they were not the blessing and it weren't the victory, but it was essential part as being set up for the blessings and they weren't the victory, but they were essential parts of the blessing and the victory. And never confuse preparation with the blessing itself. And without God's miraculous blessing, the ditches would mean no thing. They could dig the ditches and nothing would happen. But God called for them because he was going to do a miracle. They had to put the ground, the, the work into it, and then God filled those ditches. In verse uh, 21 through 25, it says, And when the Moabites heard that the kings had come up to fight against them, all who were able to bear arms and odor were gathered, and they stood at the border. Then they rose up early in the morning, and the sun was shining on the water, and the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. And they said, This is blood. The kings have surely struck swords and have killed one another. Now therefore Moab to the spoil. So when they came to the camp of Israel, Israel rose up and attacked the Moabites, so that they fled before them, and they entered their land, killing the Moabites. Then they destroyed the cities, and each man threw a stone on each good piece of land and filled it, and they stopped up all the springs of water and cut down all the good trees. But they left the stones of Ker Harashath intact. However, the slingers surrounded and attacked it. So verses 21 through 25 here, as the Moabites looked down at the unfamiliar water in the ditches that were dug in the valley below them, the combination of the sun rays and the red sandstone terrain, it gave the water a reddish color. In many parts of the United States and Especially if you've been to Oahu, Hawaii, you probably know what red dirt is. And if red dirt gets, you know, water in it, it kind of has a blood type, you know, a reddish type color that looks like blood. And unaccustomed to water being in these places and having no storm to explain water being in these places, the Moabites thought that the coalition of kings had slaughtered each other and so went after the spoils. And the coalition army led by Israel defeated the Moabites who had been delivered into their hands by the Lord sovereignly. And the coalition army invaded Moab and besieged its capital city of Ker Horasath that was located approximately 11 miles east of the Dead Sea and approximately 20 miles northwest of Arabah. And the reddish water, it confused the enemies of God's people, and that would result in their defeat. Because they were probably too busy trying to figure out, how is this possible? But uh, verse 26 to 27, the, coming in for a land in here, says, And when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too fierce for him, he took with him 700 men who drew swords to break through to the king of Edom, but they could not. 
Then he took his eldest son, who would have reigned in his place, and offered him as a burnt offering upon the wall. And there was a great indignation against Israel. So they departed from him and returned to their own land. And so, verses 26 and 27 here, in desperate hope for intervention by his idol god, Mesha, he sacrificed the oldest son to the Moabite god, Chemosh. And this was done in plain view of everyone inside and outside the city, an attempt to induce Chemosh to deliver the Moabites from disastrous defeat. And it's best, it seems best to understand that the king's sacrifice inspired the Moabites to hate Israel even more and to fight more intensely. And their fierceness perhaps led Israel to believe that Chemosh was fighting for the Moabites. And therefore, the indignation of fury, fury came from the Moabites. And so to wrap up the passage here today, in chapter 3, we look at the summary of Jer, uh, Jeroboam's, Jehoram's reign in the son of Ahab. And we looked at Moab's rebellion, and we see the unity of Israel with Judah joined together to fight Moab. And we see that the armies of Israel, Judah, and Edom, they are stranded in the desert with no water. And we see that the godly king, Jehoshaphat, sought God's word on the matter. And we saw that Elisha agreed to speak with the three kings. And we see that the word from God, that God would meet their provisional need through a contingent offer on their part. And this would be the mysterious water flowing through the camp as God was going to have them dig their ditches. And we saw the Moabites attack the camp of the three kings. And we see the ending where king of Moab makes a desperate move. In verse 27, we see in the very last verse a very graphic ending, and it caused a great indignation against Israel. And what we must understand when we go through the Old Testament and we see things like child sacrifice, that child sacrifice is blasphemous in God's sight. It is an abomination of God. Child sacrifice was an abomination of God in the Old Testament here, and it's still an abomination today among us through the acts of abortion. And... Leviticus 18.21 says that giving your children as an offering to Molech profanes the name of the Lord. And Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 31 is what calls child sacrifice to the gods as an abomination. You know, as Christians, we need to be vocal. I really enjoyed this past week on Sunday, Apology of Church, Apology of Studios on YouTube. Go check it out, the sermon. From Pastor Jeff Durbin, he spoke on perverse justice and their church's mission to bring the end of abortion and to, you know, use abortion ministry as an evangelistic tool, but also to bring morality. And as Christians, we ought to hate evil as the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, as Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13 tells us. And I want to read a verse that the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 9. And it says here, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. And may we follow Paul's instruction, if you get nothing out of today's video, may we follow what Paul's instruction was to have an authentic love while hating the things that are evil in God's sight and holding fast to what is good. And that's going to wrap up this video for tonight. And we'll see you on Saturday next as we're going to do a topical Saturday video on a topic to be announced on Saturday. And I hope that you join us for that. And God bless. Have a great rest of the week.